Right, uh, hello everyone, um, hello. welcome. Uh, if this is the seminar you're expecting to be in, welcome. If it's not, you're still welcome, but feel free to, to leave as well. Um, I won't be offended. Um, uh, just to say by way of introduction, my, my name's Steve. I'm on the planning committee for the convention. Um, live pretty local to Nottingham, part of Ryland's uh, Community Church, which is the best church in Nottingham. Um, without, without these facilities, anyway. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I'm going to be leading us in our thinking about keeping our head in a world of scoffers, thinking particularly, uh, I guess, how we uh, begin to formulate answers to the questions that, that come at us. Um, I should say I'm sort of no expert. I've done a bit of reading, a bit of thinking, uh, but I'd love us to, uh, as much as we can, sort of chat together. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully it'll be a, a useful time in the next hour or so. Uh, let me pray, though, and then uh, we'll, we'll kick on. Uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Um, our great father, we, um, we recognise that we uh, live in a culture that increasingly is confused about what we believe, uh, finds, it, um, finds it surprising, uh, is often perhaps even offended by it. Um, but we thank you that this, this wonderful gospel that has saved and rescued us is the same gospel that will, is all of your power uh, for the salvation of, of everyone who believes. Uh, and as we think together about how we might hold it out in a world that, um, uh, to friends, neighbours, uh, to our communities where they're they just don't get it um, or they feel they scoff at it. Um, as we think a little bit about that this morning, um, would you help us to begin to know how to give reasons uh, for the hope that we have? Um, and I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to imagine uh, with me that it's, um, I don't know who your football team is, if you have a football team, but imagine your team is in the Champions League uh, final and you've gone to a pub with a load of mates and you're sat in your booth uh, the screens on pint in your hand or Diet Coke whatever your choice um, is uh, to drink and you're enjoying the game uh, it's tense it's loud uh, it's exciting uh, but then halfway through the second half just as things are, are getting interesting into the pub bursts Gandalf and Frodo and they make their way to the front of the pub uh, and they shut down the sound and they just turn off the screen and they announce good news uh, the ring of power has been cast into the fiery mountain and the great shadow of death has escaped middle earth forever everyone sits there a little bit confused and then they turn on the screen and the sound comes back up and on you get with the football. Now, silly, obviously, illustration, uh, but I wonder if that is often, uh, quite often, how our evangelism goes. Uh, we interrupt our friends' lives with this news of how God has stepped into the world to deal with death and sin, to rescue us from the judgment to come, to offer us life forever. Uh, we announce it and we proclaim it, but we feel like this. This is a, a guy who's got the unfortunate name of Randy Newman, wrote a book called Questioning Evangelism. And he says this, frustration might be the most common emotion that Christians associate with evangelism. We're frustrated that our message doesn't yield more decisions, genuine fruits, cultural impact, or the advancing of God's kingdom. Modern culture is not altogether opposed to the gospel, but it is out of all connection with it. It not only prevents the acceptance of Christianity, it prevents Christianity even from getting a hearing. I wonder if that resonates with you. As you think about talking about Jesus to your friends, that you feel frustrated, that it's just, it feels disconnected from their world uh, and their lives and feels hard to know. How do, we, how do we speak the gospel, the message about Jesus into people's lives like that? And that's why I want this seminar for us to, to think through together. How can we start to formulate speaking the gospel to people? So not that we sound like Frodo and Gandalf in the pub, uh, but that we're their mates sat alongside. 
uh, being able to articulate something of the lordship of Jesus uh, into the world that they live as well. That's what we're going to think about um, together. What I'd like to do on your handout, hopefully you should see um, some headings, uh, some passages. We've got 1 Peter 3, Colossians 4, and then 2 Timothy 4. Um, uh, if this side of the room, uh, sort of right, right far side, if you could look at uh, 1 Peter 3, uh, sort of this middle, middle chunk, can you look at Colossians uh, 4? Uh, and this side, can you talk to your neighbour about 2 Timothy 4? If you finish yours, then move on to another one. Uh, but I just wanted to say we got a bit of speed and we work our way through. And what I want you to do is look at those, have a read of the, the text. Uh, very simple, say what you see question. What's the exhortation that the writer gives? What's the command? And what's the context in which the command is given? So what's the situation that the command is to be um, obeyed in? Is that all right? So a couple of minutes, uh, 1 Peter 3, far side, Colossians 4 in the middle, and this side, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5. Um, got three minutes, so go. It's a very easy question. Just go for it. Okay, let's, um, let's hear, from, hear from you. Um, so we'll start with the 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy passage. What's the, what are the various, I guess, the various commands? And what the, what's the context for those commands? This, was this side of the room? To be an evangelist, yep. So to do the work of an evangelist, that's towards the end, isn't it? Verse five, yep. Preach the word, word. yep. Be prepared, prepared. yep. Yep. So using the word to do something in in people's lives, yep. Say that again. Okay, yep. Said uh, discharge all the duties. Uh, I don't know if that's a catch-all for everything else. Or... Yeah, you have to answer your emails as well, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I kind of looked at that as to pastoral care. care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, endure hardship. Thank you. Yeah. What is the so that sort of takes us to the context? What is the context that Paul gives these commands to Timothy in? I take them like satisfy their own desires. Mm-hmm. Yep, so there's a, there's a hardship of people that are, uh, won't put up, uh, verse 3, won't put up with healthy teaching, sound teaching. Um, interestingly, I think in 2 Timothy, it's, it is the, obviously an external culture that's hostile, but I think more so in 2 Timothy particularly, it's within the church. So particularly in chapter 3, it's, there's false teachers. So if you look at chapter 3, verse 5, he says, uh, these people have a form of godliness but deny its power I um, have nothing to do with such people there's a um, yeah it's not just the external out there world and we're all safe it's no this this will the situation Timothy will find himself in is that people that he's preaching to uh, won't want to put up with him but he's to literally uh, verse 5 he's to keep his head to keep doing the right things of preaching the word and proclaiming the word and using the word to to help people uh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Colossians 4. Um, if you want to turn to it, you can. Um, so Colossians 4, uh, 2 to 6. What's the, what are the different commands and the context there? Uh, devotion. <coughs> devotion to prayer. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Be gracious and wise. Be gracious and wise. In what way are we to be gracious and wise? As you speak to others. Yeah, as you speak to others. Yeah, there's a... Uh, I heard someone say that it's a kind of a command to make sure your your conversation is adapted and suited to each person or situation that you're you're speaking into. Yeah. Take opportunities as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So take opportunities, but also, like Paul says, pray for those opportunities, doesn't he? So, in verse uh, verse three is pray for an open door for the message that I may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. Um, and there's a sense in which as they, they're praying for those doors to open for Paul and I guess themselves there to, to make the most of those opportunities. Um, any ideas on the context of this? Like what's the, slightly trickier I think. Well, it's obviously a, a very antagonistic culture I mean, yeah Paul's in prison, Paul's in prison. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly I mean yeah 
So presumably they've heard that he's in prison. Um, there's a lot about in Colossians of Paul's um, struggles and toiling and finding things difficult, which suggests that perhaps the Colossians have been shaken a bit by the fact that Paul's in prison. Um, so again, it's this command to make the most of the opportunity in the context of, of difficulty and people opposing them. Great, thank you. What about 1 Peter 3? If everyone could turn to 1 Peter, we're just going to hang out in 1 Peter for a bit. Um, so 1 Peter 3, what's the commands and what's the context of the commands? Have no fear. Have no fear, yep. So don't be afraid. Always be prepared. Yep. For what? It's not a scout, is it? <laughs> yeah. 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 Realise you're protected. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Realise that we're in God's hands and He will actually protect us in the situation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's him picking up on earlier parts of the letter, which like suffering produces good and gets you ready for the new creation yeah so don't don't be frightened because the lord even in this difficulty is at work yeah 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 thank you so verse 16 um end of verse 15 beginning 16 we're to to be gentle respectful to keep a clear conscience uh, as we speak to those who maliciously speak against our good behavior so it's it's in the context of people that are really opposing you, that you're enemies, that speak badly about you. Um, so verse 13, who is going to harm you if you're eager to do what's good? Um, and in the context, there's suffering for doing good, um, doing good there. There's one more command that's not picked up on. Setting apart Christ as Lord. Yeah. So I suppose it's like the um, things are challenging in that perspective that in the grand scheme of things Christ is, is our Lord so, so we look to, to him and we obey mm. above all, all, all things around us mm. yeah thank you yeah so the lordship of Jesus in your heart is the thing that you're to to prioritize here uh, and interestingly in verse 15 um, how do you set apart Christ as Lord in your heart in this verse it's by being prepared to answer those who ask you for a reason for the hope that you have. Um, so I hope you see in all of these all of these passages, the responsibility of the Lord's people in the face of scoffing, whether that's in inside the church or outside the church, is a preparedness to speak about Jesus. Um, we're to we're to live ready to give answers. Um, we're to think carefully, I guess, if we're, uh, if we're to speak wisely and seasoned with salt, if we're going to give reasons, like um, a, I think the word there is apologia, so in 1 Peter, a, a reasoned defence, so it's a, it's a thoughtful response. It's not just sort of saying the gospel to people out loud and, as though those are magic words, but reasoning it out, persuading people. <coughs> Uh, we need to then be thinking through, well, how does this message connect with this person and their question? Uh, part of living with Jesus as Lord is being ready to give um, answers, uh, to be able to, to be ready to be able to connect the good news about Jesus with our friends, neighbours and the community around us. So that we're not like Gandalf and Frodo, <laughs> but we're like fellow human beings sat next to them saying, we've got good news to explain. Uh, and to show you and it connects with your the world that you that you live in so the next question then is well how how do we do that um, why is it that people scoff in the first place and um, how can we begin to be prepared to give an answer to those who ask us for the reason for the hope that we have um, and to do that Romans chapter 1 is an enormously helpful place to go um, a lot of the rest of this session, if you um, want to fall asleep and want a book to read, <laughs> then um, uh, Dan Strange has written a book called um, Making Faith Magnetic or Keeping Faith Magnetic, something like that. It's on the bookstall. It's in the, the end of resources at the end of this. Um, really helpful 
um, stuff in there as, yeah, that unpacks basically what we're going to do really briefly together. Uh, but turn to Romans chapter 1, um, and I'm going to read it 18 through to, to 25. Um, and the question I want you to then talk to your neighbour or those around you after is, how does Paul describe humanity in these verses? What's our relationship with God and what's, um, uh, uh, what are we like? Uh, what's he what we like in response to what he's done okay so that's that's the question so chapter 1 verse 18 the wrath of god is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about god is plain to them because god has made it plain to them for since the creation of the world god's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images (coughs) made to look like mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. So how does Paul describe us? So this is a lot of people have said this is a kind of a commentary on Genesis 3. Uh, so it's describing all of us. How does Paul describe humanity? What's our relationship to God and the world that, that he's made? Okay, three minutes, go, and the people around you. Okay, let's uh, see what you thought. Um, so how does Paul dis- describe our relationship to God? What's, what's he done? How have we responded to what he's done? Um, what do you think? We know God and we see him through the creation, so we're aware of God's existence. So we're in a place of knowledge against the stars. Yeah, yeah. It's quite clear in verse 19, God has made it plain. <laughs> like it's, it's obvious that he's there. Yeah. But the truth is suppressed. Yeah. How is the truth suppressed? Okay. Because they are, are creating an idol out of knowledge yep. in the same way that in the Old Testament they created an idol out of wood and covered it in gold. It's just a mental idol, not a physical one. Yeah. And I wouldn't say that's true of all science, but yeah. certainly like the exchanging. So the attitude yeah. 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 So there's an, an exchange goes on. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's no, um, as someone said, there's no, uh, there's no neutrality. It's not like there's people look at the world and face it neutrally. Like there's without that, we're all, we're all suppressing the truth that we see. Uh, God's made himself known. Um, I remember seeing a, a program where they said that through mitochondrial DNA, they trace every human being now back to a single ancestor. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, okay, so now he's just got to have to admit to Adam and Eve. And, you know, so he, he set out all the evidence. That was the only conclusion. Yeah. And then he said, of course, we're not suggesting that everybody came from one human being, <laughs> but the lines of all the other human beings have died out and all of us do connect back to one. But don't think for one minute we're talking about... <laughs> Yeah. One human being. And I thought, you've, you've just given all the evidence. Yeah, and yeah. And then said, but don't, don't believe what I've just, just said. Told yes. Because yeah. otherwise mm. you'd be believing the Bible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah there's a reason Paul says that they're, that we, we, we shouldn't say they're, we, we're part of this as well, aren't we? It's, it's about us, that we're futile and foolish in our thinking. We've become darkened uh, because we refuse to give thanks. Um, if he's to acknowledge the Lord. Anything else about how we're described here and what we've done? 
inexcusable. Inexcusable. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. There's no one out there that's can like I well I didn't know. <laughs> like we're all without without excuse. Yeah. We're under judgment as well, aren't we, with this? So so mm. this that we're seeing is a demonstration of God handing over yeah. um, you know, humanity to, to their own sinful desires. Yeah. So it's a form of God's judgment, isn't it? Yeah. So obviously the wrath of God is being revealed to yeah. That's really sobering, isn't it? I remember when I it sort of studying this quite a few years ago now, it dawned on me that when I sin, it's not that God is angry because I do wrong things. That I do wrong things is evidence that God is angry. Um, that's the logic of Romans 1, isn't it? God's handed humanity over. Yeah. And so that's, so yeah, that I sin shows that I'm under, if that's under wrath. You want to do it, off you go. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So let it take its of course. Yeah. yeah. And then if you read the rest of the chapter, it's this sort of spiral downwards to approving of things that are clearly wrong. And um, yeah. Yeah. So we're, and Paul says here that we're all responding, all of us are responding, every human being, every culture is responding to revelation of who, who God is. Um, of what he's revealed about himself and and particularly Paul says if you look down uh, at verse 20 what is it that we're responding to that God has revealed it's his divine um, sorry his eternal power uh, and divine nature those particularly are the things that are clearly revealed uh, just for the sake of time um, people have argued that what does it mean by his eternal power well it's that um, it's obvious from the creation that we are dependent upon him, uh, that we need him, that we're created to rely upon him. Um, as Paul puts it elsewhere in Acts 17, in him we live, move and, and have our being. Uh, and what is divine nature? What is it that we've seen about that? Well, that, that God is not an it or a force, but a person. He has a nature. We, as again, as Acts 17, Paul puts it, we are his offspring. Uh, so God's made it clear that we're dependent on him and that we're accountable to him. That's what's clearly revealed. And the reality, our response to that is that we hate that we're accountable and we hate that we're dependent. And so we suppress the truth. Um, we play a cosmic game of, of hide and seek, um, if you like. We, we pretend that God is hiding um, when he's, it's, he's not. Um, and we do that by exchanging the glory of God for created things. So instead of depending on God and being accountable to him, we look at the things that he's made and say, no, we're gonna depend on that instead. That's gonna be the, the source of our hope and our happiness, our security and our, our significance. Um, we exchange God's glory and we create mimics, uh, mimics of him. Uh, a few, quite a few people have commented on this. Um, so here's some for, from a great little book called Reasons of the Heart by William Edgar. He's uh, summarising this passage. He says, look, thus in effect, Paul says that in various ways and various expressions, all people are somehow hiding from the God they really know. Uh, John Calvin in his Institutes puts it like this. There is within the human mind and indeed every natural instinct and an awareness of divinity that is placed there by God who repeatedly sheds fresh, fresh drops. Uh, and then a guy called Ted Turnow, he, commenting on culture, um, uh, sort of, uh, and particularly pop culture, says this uh, in response to these verses. He says, we must understand that creation does reveal God. People typically think that culture boils down to human beings making their own meaning in an otherwise chaotic and meaningless universe. But when we do culture, we aren't simply making meaning. Rather, we are responding to meaning that is already there, woven into creation. Creation hums and buzzes and rustles and sings with the songs to its creator. These songs are around us and even in us. When we do culture, we aren't taking that meaning-filled creation, sorry, we're taking that meaning-filled creation and reshaping it in our hands. We hear and feel and respond to meaning, even as we fashion new meanings from it. Creation serves as God's stereo system, proclaiming messages about his own glory, love and wrath. And we respond to that culturally. Culture, in a sense, dances 
to the tune of God's sound system. Uh, in different ways, those guys are saying, look, your friends, the people that you talk to, are already responding to who God is in the way that they live. So the guys that you sat next to in the football in the pub watching the football, the, the longings that they're experiencing and the desires that they're experiencing that are sort of turned on football for that moment are, are, are responses to the world that God has made around them. So there's, we've got real connections with the people around us. But where do objections come from? Um, well, turn, the, turn over the page on your handout. We'll, we will speed up a bit now. Uh, where do objections come from? If this is who we are in, Ro- in Romans 1, then it's just helpful to see that the objections are, that people have, that as people scoff at the Christian message, are tied to who they are as human beings responding to the revelation of God in the world. Uh, so Dan Strange puts it like this, idols are to be found at the level of, of ultimate at the level of presuppositions, ultimate explanations, ultimate authorities, ultimate commitments. Idols are how we suppress the truth and substitute the truth. Uh, Tim Keller um, wrote a paper called Defeat of Beliefs. He says this, doubts, people's doubts are beliefs. Our purpose with these defeaters, um, excuse me, sorry, Our purpose with these defeaters or doubts is not to answer them or refute them, but to deconstruct them. That is, to show that they're not as solid or as um, natural as they first appear. It is important to show that all doubts and decisions to Christianity are alternate beliefs and faith acts about the world. If you say, I just can't believe there is one true religion, that's a faith act. You can't prove that. And when you see your doubts are really beliefs, and when you require the same amount of evidence for them that you're asking of Christian beliefs, then it becomes evident many of them are very weak and largely adopted because of cultural pressure. In a broad sense, a person's religion is what grips his heart most strongly, what motivates him most deeply. If society worships idols, false gods, that worship will govern the culture of that society. If a society worships the true God, that worship will deeply influence, even pervade its culture. If, like ours, a society is religiously divided, then it will reveal a mixture of religious influences. Uh, Take some time to reflect on those. Those are big, big quotes, I know. But essentially they're saying, look, the, the objections that people have flow out of the way that they've responded to the revelation of God in the world. If they've exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they're worshiping a created thing, then their commitment to that created thing is what's creating the objection to you saying Jesus is Lord. Um, So, for example, if in our culture we say, and lots of people would say this, that um, being able to express your sexuality is fundamental to your identity, so to be human is to express your sexuality, whatever, whatever your sexuality is, then when we as Christians say that we think that homosexuality is wrong, what our friends are hearing us say is not just homosexuality is wrong, what they're hearing is, you're not really a human being. You're telling me I can't be human because I think humanity, being human means expressing my sexuality. And so you see, as you think to engage, maybe the question to wrestle with your friend who is is gay and has that question is not so much let me tell you all the place in the bible where it says homosexuality is wrong but a better discussion might be well what's a human being and what's a human being for and how does a human being flourish what do you think because i don't i think we flourish because we're made by god and for god not do you see you see how that's a very different conversation when we're talking about well what's a human being rather than you know you shouldn't do what you're doing um, because it's, the, it's that, that commitment to that idol, to the, the exchanging of the truth that creates the objection. Uh, I think that's why if we don't understand that, we often speak past people because we're, we're, we're arguing about two very different things. In our last um, 15 minutes or so, I want us to see um, an, an, an example of how Paul does this. So flick back in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17.
Uh, and what I want to do is give a bit of a framework for how you might start to be prepared to give an answer by seeing Paul do this in, uh, the, in Athens when he goes to the Areopagus. So Acts uh, 17, look down at verse 16. Uh, let me read it to us for, for time's sake. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as those in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived in there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we're God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human hands, human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them were Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Um, What I want you to do um, for five minutes or so is just answer those questions on your handout. So if you think about Paul's theology of human beings in Romans 1, here we see it applied in his speech to the Areopagus. He demonstrates to them that God can be known and that they do know the truth about God. Uh, He also um, shows what they believe is foolish how they've exchanged the truth about god for a lie he sort of pulls deconstructs it as keller would have it in hit the quote and then he calls them to believe and obey the gospel so how just have a think about how he's doing that and use those questions as a guide uh, for five minutes and then we'll we'll sum up okay go okay do you want to see where we get to Uh, some feedback um so how does paul demonstrate to the athenians that they that they know god already yeah 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 how else they're poets yeah thank you so he quotes their own literature like he spent time so yeah there's two there's a poet and there's a, a philosopher in verse 28 you in him we live move and have our being like you already know what i'm about to proclaim what i'm proclaiming to you like this is not this is not new to you yeah so he shows them that they already believe the things he's about he wants to proclaim um how does he expose their um what is their what is their ultimate explanation um, who or what are they they trusting in? Gods of everything. Okay, go on, just unpack that a bit. Uh, well, yeah, idols that, that cover every aspect of their lives, yeah. which is why they need the, you know, the, the, the unknown God yes. to, 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 to catch everything they perhaps haven't thought of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a catch-all. It's a catch-all, yeah, they're covering all their bases, aren't they? Yeah. Ultimately, it's human wisdom, isn't it? Because they, they love the new idea. 
Yeah. They worship the, the human wisdom. The, the yeah, it's. I think that's the ultimate thing. Yeah, they is themselves <laughs> and their own knowledge. So you see that in verse twenty-one. Luke, Luke gives us this little sidebar. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time in doing nothing except talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Like you know, that's that's what they're about. It's about like yeah, knowledge and do we know? Have we have we covered all the bases? Yeah. I mean, going back to Romans one, which talks about people creating images of gold and wood, etc. Well, these gods are made in the image of man. Yeah. So it's it's a similar process to what is described in Romans Romans 1 yeah they've yeah. just created gods in their own image. yeah 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 thank you and how does Paul expose that then how does he show that it's a foolish lie that they're futile and darkened in their thinking to use his language of Romans 1 God does not need anything but wants their worship yeah and how does, so how does he expose that though so that he, he says that but how does he persuade them of it Show them that they've, they're a bit silly. Yeah. Yeah. Their wisdom has created gods who are reliant. Yeah. God himself is not reliant. Yeah. The, the, the true God it doesn't need anything from anyone. Yeah. But their gods do. Yeah. yeah. So he just exposes it, doesn't he? Say, look, you believe that God is, the unknown God is, the one in whom we live, move and have our being. That's your belief. But you're building things that are made with human hands. Like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> he exposes it, doesn't he? Say, like, do you not see how that doesn't work? It, it doesn't mash up. You, you're, you're doing something foolish. And then he calls them, doesn't he, to put their trust in Jesus like the God they can know the God who's really there who really lives moves and has their being because of Jesus has been been raised from the dead so do you see how what Paul does in Athens is kind of how his theology of Romans 1 is sort of instructing how he's wanting to expose the idols that are going on um, in Athens so on your handout here's a this is uh, blatantly stolen from uh, Dan Strange's um, book um, it's particularly from his book it's a book called Plugged In but he mentions it in the Magnetic Faith as well the, as you this is not something you want to do when you sort of meet with people this is not a sort of I'm going to go through all of these things but as we prepare to give answers to people here's four ways four E's to, to think about so firstly you want to step into and discern what it is that people uh, are worshipping uh, so what is their their gospel story um, what is it that they're believing Paul does that so in verse uh, Acts 17 23 says I walked around and observed carefully your objects of worship um, just on the back page of your handout I've given you uh, something that um, uh, where is it yeah alternate gospel stories so this is from a book on your um, Tim Chester's book um, like how do you sort of determine what someone's gospel story is well you you sort of fill in what they believe about why we're here what the problem is how is redemption how is what's the solution and what's our future hope and the example they use is um, like love in our culture so what's the gospel story the false gospel is I need to be loved what's the false problem the problem is i don't get the love that i need what's the solution what's the gospel rescue in that worldview well my solution is to offer my body to people that they might love me um, and what's the fruit what's the hope my hope is that having sex will make people love make me feel loved and complete but it just doesn't so that do you see how they, they, they we've got a gospel and our gospel is i'm made to be loved by god the problem is I don't love God as I should. The solution is I need to stop loving myself and see the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And what's my future? My hope is to know the God who is loved for, forever in his new creation. You see, false gospel, true, true gospel. So that just takes time. Um, that takes time. You need to know your friends, <laughs> uh, know what it is that they are believing. Uh, what is it? What's the story that they're telling themselves about the world? How are they exchanging the truth about God 
for a lie to worship and serve created things so we enter uh, we step into the worldview of other people what is it they believe uh, then we explore so um verse 23 again paul says people of athens i see that in everywhere you're very religious for as i walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship i even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown god so he's looking around and he's saying look what is it that's good about what these people believe uh, wh where can i find connections where can i say i can agree with that i'm with you on that um and um and yeah and and then see if you can identify the idols that attach to them thirdly then we want to de like do the deconstruction that tim keller talked about in his the quote like so he does it in verse 29 therefore since we're god's offspring we should not think that divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill he says look i know that you're after the transcendent that's what you're really after but you like you you're looking for it in something you've made and that's that's ridiculous it doesn't that doesn't work so you expose it and then he says he shows them the gospel of christ in the one in whom they can find rest like all that you're looking for is found in jesus the god who's made himself known and the proof of that is in the resurrection i find it fascinating in verse um where is it uh, la, 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 la. if you look down at verse 30 he says in the past god overlooked such ignorance and i think that's really interesting a way of of sort of finishing off his talk to them because if you think about how god describes idolatry in the old testament if you think about hosea and it's like whoredom is idolatry there it's an abomination it's um like ignorant just seems a bit light compared to how the bible actually describes idolatry but do you see how that actually speaks into the very thing that they're after they want to be a group of people who know things and so the last thing that they want to be called is ignorant of something and so in offering them the gospel he says look the thing you're after real knowledge is found in jesus who's the god who's made himself known and the proof of that is in the resurrection this is the gospel i'm proclaiming to you the very thing you want is you find ultimately um, in jesus christ now i thought this would happen we ran out of time um but on your third sheet there i've given you a little grid um and not for now but if you want to do it you can but why not take some time to think about your friends and think about the questions that they have and start to fill in those boxes um, like what is their story um, what is it that they're worshiping what is it that they're trusting in um, how how might i expose that uh, how might i speak the gospel to them that'd be a great thing to do or just to take any any difficult question that we face in our culture things like isn't christianity against diversity or um, how isn't Christianity true for you but it doesn't need to be true for me like start to unpick those questions and think okay what's what's the idol that people are worshipping that leads to this objection or this question and how can I start to deconstruct it and proclaim the gospel um, into it uh, let me close though with this um, this lovely quote from a guy called Bavink and uh, with that we'll we'll pray and and finish um, Uh, i love this so for all our effort <laughs> um, uh, wanting to help people um, and think carefully about our friends and speak the gospel into their situation uh, bavink writes this the gospel of christ addresses people and rips open their religiousness consciousness people want to suppress and push away the gospel in the worst way just as they've repeatedly done with god but it can happen that god causes their heart to submit then all the energies of resistance are switched off and people listen then the king of glory makes his entrance the everlasting doors of the understanding are thrown open and this is what we call the new birth um, for all the talk of think carefully prepare well 
work hard uh, like the reality is it's the gospel that is all of god's power for salvation that's where our, ultimately our confidence has to be and i hope you've heard this afternoon this morning all i've said is how do we proclaim that gospel in a way that people hear it in their world the world that we all live in rather than like frodo and gandalf in the pub let me pray and we'll close um, our great father we recognize as we prayed earlier that we do live in a world where increasingly people don't understand what we we're saying we're like paul in athens where people think we're babbling like what are you trying to tell us and i thank you for paul's love for the athenians that he didn't just shout louder uh, he didn't just speak the gospel and say well you need to you need to try and understand what i'm saying but he observed who they were, what they loved, what they treasured, what they worshipped and helped them to see that Jesus is Lord is the good news that they really, they're really searching for. And I pray for each of my brothers here um, with our family, our kids, our grandkids, our neighbours, our friends, our communities. Uh, would you help us to be prepared to give a reason to anyone that asks us for the hope that we have? Uh, to do that gently, uh, to do that respectfully, to be wise in the way that we speak towards outsiders. Um, give us that kind of love that seeks to really understand where people are at so we can speak the gospel into their world. Uh, and as we do that, our great father, we ask that the King of glory would make his entrance into the lives of our families and friends. I guess even as I pray that into our hearts and minds of each of us comes people we love that we'd love to respond to the gospel please this christmas as we have so many easy opportunities would the king of glory make his entrance and would the doors of ever the everlasting doors of understanding be thrown open and i ask that for jesus sake amen